Um, I'm Maria Kokolis. Mm -hmm. We're good. Um, I uh, am formerly the director um, for a large healthcare system. I was the director of a psychologically driven, multidisciplinary <laughs> wellness uh, program there. And, um, and essentially, what led me to, um, I'm currently pursuing a PhD in health psychology, and what <coughs> led me to specialize in, in health psych and then work in particular with food addictions and obesity is um, about five or six years ago, I um, was, well, I was misdiagnosed for a year. So is that the necklace? Okay, I was, um, I was misdiagnosed for a year and finally properly diagnosed with um, what finally was chronic Lyme disease. And um, in my life, I, um, I typically, I've, I was an athlete my whole life, so I was pretty fit and I ate fairly well and, um, and I'm fortunate to have the support of a wonderful family and friends and, and I, but I did struggle with it um, and I basically was told that if I did not lead the lifestyle I was leading I would have pretty much been in a wheelchair. <laughs> so, um, so what happened was it, I had a discussion with a good friend of mine who was a physician at this healthcare system mm -hmm. and I, you know, mm -hmm. he kind of knew what was going on and I said to him, look, you know, there's so many people out there who if, you know, if something happens to them, we're not practicing prevention. And you know, what would happen to some of these other folks? And he has a he had a great interest in um, in wellness and in prevention. And you know, we had the discussion that in the healthcare system today, physicians just don't have the time um, to be able to to do what they want to be doing. And so we uh, so he asked me to write a business plan, which I did, and we we took it to the board, and they approved it. And so. Um, we rolled out this uh, multidisciplinary program and we essentially got uh, primary care referrals. And when the referrals came in, um, here I thought I was going to be working a lot with, you know, chronic pain and autoimmune disorders and, you know, and it was 99% of the referrals that were coming in were for obesity from physicians. And so, you know, then I um, streamlined what I was doing and realized um, as, as patients would come in, um, they really, they, they really were struggling with the food piece and with the eating behavior. Um, and so, and that kind of led me to, to my work in food addiction. Um, and as a health psychologist, almost, <laughs> um, what I did is there's, yes, there's the clinical work with the patients, but there was also a lot of education on my end um, with the physicians. Um, the physicians really struggle to broach the topic with their patients. Um, it's a tough one to bring up to tell your patients that it, they are obese. Um, the other thing I found with the physicians is that um, they they just don't have the, they don't know they don't know what the resources are, um, and they're giving patients a clean bill of health who are obese because their labs look okay. So so. This is what we're talking about today. Um, we are going to get into the heart of food addiction, but I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of background of you know why I'm even here talking about this today. <laughs> All right. So food addiction. Okay. So um, so primarily we are going to have a, a focus on obesity because it is um, food addiction is a, a huge underlying cause of obesity. Um, it's a large contributing factor to obesity and has a profound impact on uh, not only personal well-being but on the demand for health care as well as American uh, health care costs. Um, it's reached pandemic levels. Um, it is critical to understand food addiction and how the brain interacts with the obesogenic environment. Um, there is a fast-growing consensus that obesity might be understood within the same neuro neurobiological framework as addiction and uh, research investigation and treatments for obesity should be shaped according to the theory for food addiction. And I am gonna later discuss um, what I did for treatment for food addiction and uh, consequently obesity, um, but I'll get into that in, the, in a little bit. Okay, these are just some quick statistics on um, what's happening. Um, Obviously, the, 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 there's an increased incidence of obesity and of morbid obesity and overweight. Currently, about 66% of our country is overweight or obese. That's where we're at. Um, in the 1960s, we've got BMI pulled out over here. 
just so that you understand body mass index, a healthy body mass index, you're looking at somewhere in the low, about 18 to 25 is what's considered a healthy body mass index. Um, when you go from about 26 to 29, that's considered overweight. And then 30 and above, 30 to 40 is considered obese. And then 40 and above is considered morbidly obese. Um, so when you look at the numbers, uh, you're looking at the weights for women anywhere between 20 and almost 50 years old. And in the 60s, it was 128 and 142. And we did this on a fi an average female, so about a five foot five height. Um, and then when you go to 2013, you see that it's jumped from 128 to 166 and 142 to 178 in this age group and higher, bringing the BMI to the average being obese which, um, which kind of goes in line with the almost 66%. Um, so in children, and this is a really, this is clinically a really tough, it's a tough one to work with children because it does pull in, because they're not in charge of making their own food, you know, the, the moms and the dad, or other people are doing some of the work for them, so it becomes even more complex. Um, so it's more than doubled in children, quadrupled in adolescents. Um, percentage of children 6 to 11 years in the U.S. who are obese increased 7% in 1980 to nearly 18% by 2012. Um, and then if you can just read some of the similar statistics. Um, adolescents 12 to 19 who are obese increased from 5% to 21%. And in 2012, more than a third of our children adolescents are overweight and obese. It's scary. So we just want to, we wanted to present these slides just so that you can understand what, um, why this is so important. Um, basically, one thing that I do want to say before we get into the next slide is that in the tw before the 20th century, people were dying of things that we could be vaccinated for now. Things like influenza, things like tuberculosis. Fast forward to, to where we're at now, people are dying from things like diabetes and heart disease and cancers. These are all things that are chronic health problems. So they are long term. People can live with these issues for a really, really long time, which, which stunts their quality of life. But also these things are preventable and in many cases reversible. Okay. so. And then these are, do you want to speak to, oh, to yeah. kind of start to speak yeah, to this slide? I did. Hi, everybody. I'm Valerie, the dietitian. And um, I think I want to go back to, and we're going to be jumping back and forth. We're just a team here. We all have our own ideas and um, different, coming from different um, takes on things. So if you hear us going back and forth like a discussion, it's all good. That This is what we <laughs> want to have happen. So I want to back up a little bit to the health care. Um, implications, what's going on, what's the matter with our diet. And if we had to end the discussion right now, we had a fire drill or something, all I would say to you is, we eat too much. That's the most simplistic um, statement that there is. We eat too much, thank you very much, eat less and we'll be fine. But if it was that easy, would we all be here waiting breathlessly to hear, you know, what, what the problem is? No. It's a lot more complicated than that. We're eating way too much food, way too often. And is this food um, of nutrient quality? Does it have value, the food that we're eating today, most of it? No. It's nutrient empty. There's not a lot of bang for the buck except for calories. And our body is wonderful. It has a wonderful way of taking all these calories and filling up all of our lovely little fat cells that we have around our body for protection, for energy, and for survival. But unfortunately, we have also this wonderful capability of developing new fat cells. Every time the old ones get to a certain point, we have the capacity to grow more and more fat cells. And then you see people on that show, what is it, American, The Biggest Loser? You can be five, six, seven hundred pounds. There's no end until your organs, your body, your heart gives out, or your spirit gives out on you and you're gone. So what's the matter with our diet? We're, we're eating too much. The nutrient density is of minimal value. So the nutrients that become us, we are, we are a creature. We need building blocks. The food, natural food that was designed to become assimilated into us, 
is getting scarcer and scarcer. Not that it doesn't exist, it's just that the food comes, uh, well, we'll get into that in a minute, it's just that we're not purchasing the real food. Therefore, we are not, um, we are not working properly. Our body doesn't register these chemicals, toxic chemicals in our body, and we're not functioning well. We're getting resistant to the hormones that tell us what good appetite is. We're hungry. We're not hungry. We need to stop eating. Even our pleasure center is out of whack because something like maybe red peppers and onions that I can promise you have a sweetness to them if you are in regulation for your appetite, that doesn't even register anymore. Even a little bit of sugar doesn't register anymore. Our pleasure center is so out of whack that, that we're, we're out of whack with our neurotransmitters, our hormones, and we have insulin resistance, we have leptin resistance, which helps and controls our appetite. So with that, what happens? What did Maria say? We get these things called chronic diseases. They're very expensive. She already said they're expensive. They're painful. They go on for years. And do they just affect you and me when we have high blood pressure, stroke, heart disease, um, inflammation, who else does it affect? Our families. Caretakers. Caretakers. What about the jobs? People are relying on us for jobs. Um, on and on and on. So it's not just about us. It's the impact that we have on ourselves and everyone else, these chronic diseases. And again, have you ever really thought, really thought that these are not only reversible, if we get our act together and understand what's happening. But you know what? Let's not even get there. They are preventable. Wow. They are preventable. My question in a little bit is going to be who benefits from all of this? Who's benefiting from the condition that we're in? We don't have to talk about it now, but I want you to just start thinking about it, OK? Because it's fascinating. Anyone ever read the China study? I've got a lot of books up here. We have a lot of books up here for you to look at. So. Do you want me to do the slides for you? Okay, so some of the diseases, typical insulin resistance, inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, type 2, uh, osteoarthritis, hypertension, fatty liver. Maria does a lot with fatty liver. Um, counseling, uh, cognitive decline, certain cancers. Depression and mood disorders. Let's recognize that the research shows that a high cholesterol level, high triglycerides, low levels of omega-3 fats, which mainly come from marine-based foods and walnuts and some dark greens, are responsible in some part to elevated levels of depression and mood disorders. It's all related to the components of our diet, what we're ingesting. Autoimmune disease are running rampant. Nutri um, yeah, okay. sure, absolutely. To, just to speak to that also mm -hmm. for a second. Um, my, in my work with a lot of um, physicians, when I would Sorry. get referrals, you, you definitely, I get the obesity, but with the obesity, I had a lot of, um, and it wasn't just the primary cares, I worked with a lot of orthopedic specialists or orthopedic surgeons who referred patients who were bone on bone in their knees or who had L4, L5 issues. And, um, you know, and behind the scenes, they would say to me, can you please tell this patient they need to lose weight because they didn't want to broach the subject with them. But in many cases, when I was in clinical meetings with physicians, what would happen is they would say to me, look, Maria, 90% of what I get in my office, you know, is exercise, eat right, get happy, lower your stress level, um, but they all want the magic pill is what I get from the doctors. No one wants to do the work. No one wants to hear from me what they really need to do. It's too much. They want the quick fix. So that's what's happening on the doctor side. So as long as, like I said, those labs look good, they're just sending the patients away with a clean bill of health. But then on the clinical side, when I work with patients, well, people are very intelligent. And that's kind of what the, the side that the doctors don't see, that us counselors see, is I have people who come in who say, you know, I'm here, I'm motivated, I want to lose weight, or, you know, I'm contemplating losing weight and, and getting healthy and changing my lifestyle. And they say, can you believe that, my, that I am 250 pounds at five foot two, and my doctor says, I'm healthy. I'm healthy. And they send me off. And so it's, 
it's just interesting to work on both sides of it, mm -hmm. um, and to see that not only are we struggling as a population you know, clin clinically, the people that are coming in, but also the professionals are really mm -hmm. struggling uh, in how to work with it. So that's yeah. something that I've been seeing. So I wanted to speak to that. And for another a big second. component, too, that, that is important to discuss is I know we're going to talk a lot about obesity because food addiction really does lead to a lot of obesity, which has a lot of uh, physiological, mental, emotional issues. We also are going to talk a lot about how uh, food addiction impacts those who may not be obese, who may actually be of what we perceive as a healthy weight or what doctors see as a healthy weight but still struggle with a lot of the autoimmune disorders, still struggle with a lot of the mood disorders, the anxiety, depression. Um, and so we are going to talk about that as well. So I, I do want to point out that it's not just those who are obese who are experiencing this, but others who struggle with food addiction that are on the other end of that spectrum. Thank you, Cara. And that's important because um, I feel very strongly about that because I've had issues with binge eating since college. Well, maybe no, since 12 years old. Didn't know what was happening at the time decades ago, but you know, we don't have to be obese to have these issues. I won't ask you, but again, you could just raise a little pinky or like this and go, yeah, I got some problems here. And it starts with us, and if we don't know how to recognize it and how to deal with it and to understand what's coming at us and why we are the way we are, how the heck are we gonna help our patients? You know, we all need, we all need help ourselves so that we can um, share the information and, and the support to other people out there. So I don't know about you, I'm doing this for me too. Uh, in addition to you all getting help, this is for me too. So I'm grateful for all the information and the knowledge and the honesty. And as a dietitian for 30 years, the hardest part for me is seeing a patient who thinks they're going to come one time, have all these issues since, since childhood. It could be trauma. It could be you know, genetic predisposition, new pa you know, old patterns of dealing with things. And they say, Valerie, give me a diet. Thank you very much, but I ask them to give up a little alcohol, maybe one less Pepsi, and it's like, I get reported. She, she, she's asking me to do too much. She's delving too much into my past. I've had this happen. It's not exciting out there. We need an integrated program. We need to work as a team, and we need to have our patients understand that it's not just, oh, where did it go? Ah, sorry. It's not just that um, 60 billion diet industry with the guaranteed return clients that tell you take this pill, you know, take this shot of B12 and this little, um, these little packets of food here and you'll be fine. It's nothing to do with that at all. So for me, when people go to see me, it's a little frustrating. So I'm so glad that Maria has a program. The idea of a program, multidisciplinary, is really what's needed everywhere. Okay, thanks. You can, now you can move forward. Okay, so. <laughs> So what the heck, I guess we couldn't put that in, but what the heck is happening? There is a direct correlation between the rise in prevalence of overweight and obesity and the aggressive marketing and increased availability and consumption of refined foods over the same period. So when did this all happen? How about baby boomers? I don't know, I'm a baby boomer. Probably a lot of us are baby boomers here. She's not, I don't know what she's <laughs> called. She's a baby, but not a baby boomer. Um, but back then, you know, people at the time, in the beginning of time, people were making natural food na in natural quantities and um, um, natural chemicals in the food. We were eating real food. So our body understood that and we had an appetite and everything was in balance. Weight, we were working outside. Well, baby boomers come along and moms and dads are both working now and, you know, they're busy, they want things quickly. Food companies, industrial, industrialization, food companies are coming on board. They love this idea of marketing their products, making money. How can we make more money? Let's hire food chemists, psychologists for, for teaching us the right place to put on the grocery store, the colors, the packaging, portion size, taste, everything. And before you know it, we, we have this processed food. We have beverages that are just highly sweetened, which we'll get to in a minute. And, and here we are today. Something was happening back in the 1950s that Maria is, is passionate to tell you about. And we will move on and see how that relates to addiction. Well, in, my, in some of my research, I just, it's just kind of one of those things that floored me. And it's simple, but. Um, Back in the 1940s and in the 1950s, um, there were 
cigarettes and people started smoking and it started becoming the thing people did. Well, as time went on, people realized like, okay, this is, I, I can't really give this up. I can't just get rid of this. And they were becoming addicted. And, but still they didn't really know why. I mean, at that time, people didn't know why this cigarette was, was having the effect it was having. And so it was not, so this was happening in the 40s and the 50s. Tobacco companies started to make the nicotine more and more concentrated in, per cigarette. And it was not until the 1980s, so decades later, that the Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop at the time, finally put some warning labels and sent this knowledge out to people. And so, and I just find that fascinating. I mean, you're talking about 40 or 50 years after people started to kind of wonder, what is going on? Why are we having this problem? And I really see that's where we're at with food. Currently, the Food and Drug Administration does zero testing for addictive properties in foods. They don't have to do it. So, so manufacturers can put whatever the heck they want in foods right now because no one's testing it. And they do. Right. Um, interestingly, and I just, I just came across this last week, um, in Sweden, mm -hmm. there was a warning label, the first warning label ever globally put on um, a box of cereal for children. And it was the first that it's the first time that's ever been done. So we are just that's kind of where we're at. Just to give you a feel for where this issue is globally and mm -hmm. and domestically. So mm -hmm. I just found that fascinating. <laughs> and for any of you who have any issues with overeating, binge eating, whatever word we want to use, um, boxes of cereal. I can't tell you how many women start with a bowl of cereal and a little milk, and then a little bit of sugar. And then, you know, then a lot more sugar, even though the cereal is sweetened, something like, um, oh, I don't care, you know, whatever this is, like Lucky Charms. And then before you know it, the whole box is gone. These are highly refined products, and this can bring on binge eating, trigger you to overeat in, in, in ways that you never imagined. Um, also, yeah. I'm, although I'm not the registered dietitian, mm -hmm. I will say just sort of, Generally, as a population, one way to tell if something is concentrated is on a food label. So I'm kind of taking over a dietitian's that's, no, part, that's but fine. on a food label, um, when you look for t there's there's highly dense fats and then there's highly dense sugars. So when you look at any nutrition label, under total fats, for one serving, if that number is in the double digits, so it's a, if it's over nine, if it's ten and over. You can kind of bank that's a high density fat food for one serving. When you look under carbohydrates, you go, there's a few things underneath there. One of the things says sugars. If you follow across sugars, if you see that that number's in double digits, then that is a highly dense sugar product. Yes. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and again, because we're giving you all different angles from things, another way to look at this is. For every four grams of sugar on a label, that equals one teaspoon. So we're giving you all different, all different information here, all different ways to look at the same, the same problem. For every four grams of sugar, that's a teaspoon. So if you're Lucky Charms or, I don't know, whatever, um, I'm just I'm, I'm making this up as I go. Sugar, this is uh, one bar, and that's a whole other area. How do we know? how much is a serving, you've got to look. Have you ever seen the muffins that are half a muffin? They're giving you the nutritional value of half a muffin or half of one of the bars that are in here. Or how about, how about a pie? When a serving is like an eighth of a pie. And I'm telling you, I can eat the whole pie, let alone an eighth. And it's, you know, 400 calories for a key lime pie. I know that very well. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but this says 13 grams of sugar, so 4, 8, 12, that's about a tablespoon of sugar in this product. And some of your other cereals are higher, your cookies, your, um, your fruit and nut, I love trail mix. How many of you eat just a quarter of a cup of trail mix? I mean, that's like one bite to me. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> it's not, it's not. 19, okay, here, oh, this is a third of a cup. 19 grams. So 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, like 5. Did I do that right? 5? Okay, I have to use fingers. Sorry. That's not, but anyway, 
So things are, things are very sweet. Um, the only thing I will say um, for fat is that there are fat products that are very healthy for us. So people ask me, well, avocado, isn't that high in fat? I don't have my nuts out here, but aren't nuts high in fat? You know, what's going on here? Well, yes, they're high in fat, but we desperately need a balance of heart-healthy, brain-healthy fats. Actual fat, omega-3s, um, become and cholesterol actually help to become part of the integrity of your cell walls, your brain cells, which actually facilitate communication so that the neurotransmitters can communicate back and forth. So we do need fat. What we don't need is a lot of that trans fat that comes from products that have the word hydrogenated in it. And why are products hydrogenated now? because the food companies want to extend the shelf life of that product. It has nothing to do with, with, with us and our health. It has to do with them and their profit. So fat, yes, watch out for it, but let's remember nuts, avocados, um, omega-3s. This is not a nutrition talk, but, but there's some good, good things about fat also. Anything else that we want to, while we're talking about this part? Yeah, let's go to the next one. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about um, appetite. You know, people say appetite is just that they're craving and they don't know why. But I want to talk about two things quickly, the physiologic response and the other response that's called the pleasure-seeking or the hedonic response. Humans have to survive. We want to survive. So we have to find a way to enjoy, as much as we hate it, food and sex. But, but we find a way to enjoy it somehow. And um, we have the physiologic response to eat and to flourish and to stay alive and to be able to produce. And we have something called that pleasure-seeking, hedonic uh, prospect of our um, existence. So number one, um, what happens in normal physiologic appetite? Well, I hope we have time, but let's, let's take it this way. You wake up in the morning, you've gone about anywhere from two hours to, to 10 hours fasting. Hopefully you haven't gotten up in the middle of the night to overeat or drink soda or whatever. So we have chemicals, we have um, hormones, ghrelin and something called neuropeptide Y. Ghrelin and neuropeptide Y, and this is very basic, I don't know how to explain it more in depth, sorry if that's not my background, but um, it starts uh, uh, rearing its, itself in your body the longer you're without food. So what happens is you get this urge to eat. So if you're not going to starve yourself and withhold food in the morning, a normal response is to have a healthy, balanced meal in the morning, some protein, maybe some eggs or cheese, or maybe a Greek yogurt, a little bit of carbohydrate to give your body some, some energy and some fat to help with you know, um, fat-soluble vitamins for the integrity of the brain. And they all go and do their thing. The ghrelin, the neuropeptide Y, gives us the ability to want to eat. Well, as that rises and we take care of it, then all of a sudden, maybe not all of a sudden, but insulin in response to the food takes the digested food and starts sending it out to muscles for glycogen. It sends it to the brain. The only fuel source that the brain really can use is glucose. So we have to give it a sense of nutrition constantly all day long. We don't have cells to hold the sugar or the glucose. And then the excess goes into fat cells, which, which tells the body that, it's, that we, we're, we're satisfied, we're satiated, and leptin comes out from the fat cells and says we've had enough. So we're kind of in balance and life is perfect, isn't it? That doesn't always happen, and we'll get to that in a minute because we have what's called resistance. But let's move on. Let me make sure I didn't, um, I didn't miss anything there. All right, we can move on. Oh, can we, let's back up for just one minute. So what do you, th I, I'll tell you now, what do you think happens if you don't eat in the morning? What's going to happen to that ghrelin and neuropeptide Y whose job it is to stimulate appetite? What's going to happen? Is it going to go away and say, fine, starve yourself, or is something else going to happen? Any ideas? It's going to start talking to you more and more and more. That's why restrictive diets are not good for you, because they backfire. 
can go all day without eating, but any of you ever try that because you were a bad person and you ate, over ate the wrong foods the night before, you're going to starve all day? Well, what happens when you get home after work, a stressful day? Anyone ever overeat, pig out, binge, whatever word you want to use? Am I the only one? <laughs> okay, good, thank you. I was feeling a little uncomfortable here. Um, so that's what can happen, okay? You do not want to have restrictive diets. You need to be working with your clients slowly, gently, you know, balancing out, but you don't want to restrict. So the next part of our um, normal homeostasis, appetite, is this wonderful hedonic, pleasure-seeking, dopamine reward stimulating center, pleasure reward based system. This is the component that's designed to give us desire, wanting, motivation to search and find and seek what we need for survival, but it has to be pleasurable, so for pleasure and survival. This system helps us to um, develop, or not develop, to have attentional bias an overwhelming desire for knowing what to find and for taking a lot of energy to find it. I don't know about you all, but if I have a craving, I'm going to have this attentional bias, this, this overriding urge to get something, and I'm going to be thinking about that thing until I get that thing. I can go an hour, two hours, maybe three days, but let me tell you something. After a while, I'm getting it, and I waste time and energy. I might not do the best counseling session. I might be thinking about it. D does it sound like chemical dependency at all? Mm -hmm. Is there any difference? So I want you to start thinking about how this relates to chemical dependency. Um, so the next one is just a little picture of um, the ne next slide, please. Thank you. Ta -da. So if you want to look at it, you know, basically ghrelin, leptin, um, helps our appetite. It increases dopamine and we feel good, we feel satisfied when everything is normal, when we're eating regular wholesome food. Our hedonic center, when we're eating healthy, normal foods and we're not in the addictive component, we're raising, we're raising dopamine. And the um, pyro says endogenous yes. opioids and cannabinoids. That actually Thank goes you. under bliss chemicals. I don't know what happened with the picture. Yeah, sorry. I so that's, yeah. that doesn't go under the physiologic. Yeah. That's part of the hedonic. When we talk about how foods that are highly palatable, yes. um, a lot of refined sugars or refined fats, uh, release the endogenous opioids in our body, which is our body's natural opiates. Mm -hmm. That's part of that euphoria, that part that feels really good when we start to eat mm -hmm. some Touch, of these. The food touches your tongue and, and your brain is just dinged. I like to use the word dinged, it's dunged, and you feel good. So these two systems work in concert with each other, all right? Very important, they work in concert. So, so what happens when they are out of whack and they're not working in concert? And we start not, we're not able to register normal, natural food because, our, because of the state of the content um, and ingredients of the food that we are now eating, which is causing something very similar to chemical dependency. Drugs of abuse and alcohol hijack the brain. In their natural form, their natural state they never hijacked the brain. When we take something like cocoa leaves and it becomes concentrated, extracted, we have cocaine. When we have, di oh, the bottom part's not showing. When we have distilled grains, di you know, fruits, <laughs> potatoes, they're concentrated, they're extracted, thank you. We have, tobacco. well, we have alcohol. When we take tobacco leaves and they're extracted and hyper-concentrated, Maybe with some other flavors added, I don't know. I'm not at um, Philip Morris making my chemical milieu there, little soup. We have nicotine. So this is chemical dependency. This is addiction. This is what we're, is happening. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further on in the presentation of the comparisons yes. between food addiction and chemical dependency. All right, am I doing this part? Of course, I'm doing this part then still. Did mm -hmm. I? Okay, good. I th okay. Yeah, two more slides. Yeah, two more slides. <laughs> okay, so ding, ding, ding you know, 2014 you know, now, and what do we have? You go up and down our grocery store, the aisles, not the outside maybe where the, that weird healthy stuff is, I don't even know what it's called, vegetables, fruits, I, I've heard of it, I don't know. But the rest of the grocery store, 30 aisles, you're seeing highly processed foods, not real chemicals, not real products. These things were natural at one time and they were highly processed. 
things stripped of it. You take a whole wheat kernel and you, you, you get a bottle of wheat germ. You get, a you get a box of cereal, the endosperm, the starch part. You get the, um, the fiber part. I mean, it's amazing. We spend a fortune on the extractions of all these foods and they're making a fortune, the food companies. These foods are high in fat, saturated fat that causes lots of problems with your immune system, with um, mental, mental and cognitive cognitive decline, high, high, highly concentrated sugars in all different forms, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, which is awful for our systems, for our liver, for addiction, salty snacks, desserts, chips, breads, butters, pastas, fast foods with chemicals added to them to make you want them more. They're unnatural and they're excessive. The portions are too large. Twenty years ago, you might have had five cups of popcorn. Today, for $10, plus $10 for the movie, and then $5 for the soda this big, you're getting about 11 cups of popcorn with salt and butter and crunchy. I mean, let's face it, you're done before the movie starts. And then, then you're going through withdrawal about an hour later. Next slide, and then I, I might we be... We actually have the video now. Oh, good. Oh, with all this in mind, we have an amazing short video. Should we take questions yes, now? this is uh, not or, quite yet. We okay. have... Um, this is a, the next, the following is a documentary that myself and some of my, the physicians that I used to work with um, in this One Health system absolutely love. And so I did start using it um, as part of some of the group counseling work that I did it and then used a couple of sessions just to discuss some of the things. So we'll show you the trailer. Sorry, ready? It's called can Hungry you, for you Change. It? Is it? Dear diary. Today I feel very sad and I want to eat everything. The problem is that we are not eating food anymore. We are eating food like products and they are adorned. They are made to look better and smell better so that people are attracted to them. It's not your fault. You're programmed to put on fat whenever there is food available. But now, there's a lot of food available, but it's the wrong kind. Sugar is in everything. In America, we're eating about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. Even the milk hasn't escaped. So, let me just show you. One kid, just for five years of elementary school, sugar, just from milk. You might as well be rolling up the kid's sleeve and putting in heroin, because it's the same. Marketing essentially lies to you because it presents you with the promise you're going to be sexy and popular and cool, but in reality, you're going to be obese and miserable and sick. Nothing else does it in your brain quite like a diet cola. And that's because there's a deadly combination there of aspartame and caffeine. I think most people believe the FDA actually has their own scientists that do this analysis, but that nothing could be further from the truth. If I was in the food industry, what am I looking to do? I want to sell you more food. They're into just selling a market. You can lose weight on a diet, but it's a little bit like borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. I mean, you can get 10 pounds off your body through sheer force, but you're going to have to pay back with interest. People know this, so why are highly intelligent people not stopping? Because they don't know the nature of the trap. The whole dieting paradigm is flawed. I was 31 when I realized I don't know how to take care of myself and I am sick. So I had to go back and learn all the things that I wish I had known as a child. I tried everything. I did witch doctors, I did mud baths, acupuncture, I did the lot. The one thing which I was really afraid to face up to was changing what I put into my mouth. I've never heard of a raw food restaurant. Raw food, how do you cook raw food? I thought vegan was a planet. I was over 400 pounds, and I had very bad sleep apnea. I was borderline type 2 diabetic. Cleansing and detoxification will make you lose weight, will make your eyes white, will make your skin glow. If somebody's got beautiful skin, it invites us to a deeper understanding about what's going on inside their body. 
What we're talking about is a real diet in the sense of what a species eats. When we get onto our real diet, we don't have to think about these things anymore. What do you think the body's gonna do? It's not gonna reject this at all. It's gonna look and say, now I'm on board. Now you're good to me, let me shine for you. And there's a lot more to this. It's about an hour long. I found it on, uh, Maria was kind enough to tell me it was on Netflix. So, and there's other videos like that out there also. So, um, and one of the things that we'll yeah. talk about um, as we move further on and starting to take a look at what does recovery look like or how do we begin the healing process, we're going to talk a lot about the different ways that we implement counseling skills or tools that we have as counselors to better support our patients or our clients. Um, and so that kind of starts us off of uh, taking a look at why all of this really is problematic and why it is so dangerous for what's happening in society and within our own patients. Um, and so we'll definitely get to the part where we talk about how do we begin to heal, how do we begin to move into the recovery place so that everyone can be in a, in a healthier, better body. That's right. There's hope there. We're not just going to, yeah, I'm, and I'm going to do this very quickly. Just again, just to confirm, some of those most seductive foods, addicting foods if you want to call it that, they're refined, highly sweetened, soft drinks, um, um, white flour, some people feel that gluten could be a problem for them also. There could be a sensitivity to that as well. Frozen potatoes, breakfast cereals, anything that's highly, has a lot of fat, salt, and caffeine. Um, yeah, the next slide. And again, we just want to make sure that you understand what's happening. Then we're going to have a little discussion. And then we're going to go on to what can we do about this, I promise. The food industry, remember, wants to earn profits. And they want to give us what we need and what they want, what, what we want. We, we want this stuff or we have wanted this in the past, maybe not quite now, but they're here to help us. They're here to design the foods that will sell. So their goal is to have foods that, that sell, foods that, that their food scientists, their chemists, their psychologists have found through testing and testing and studies and panels is most successful for their um, goal. Very highly concentrated potent ingredients. Combined ingredients that give us what's called a bliss point, that point where your dopamine reward system is just dinged to the point of, I gotta have it, I gotta have it now, and I gotta have more. And you'll go through withdrawal if you don't have it, so you're, you're spending that attentional bias thinking about it and wanting it. Multisensory you know, soft ice cream, like um, I was brought up in New York, so like a Carvel or a Dairy Queen with the cookies on top and the candy on top of that and the nuts and all those type of um, stores, they're making a fortune off of us, $15 for a little cup. And you send a, a swim team like I did once and all their little cups are like, you know, 9 to $12, lots of money, lots of chemicals, lots of sugar, lots of future wanting for all this stuff too. Large, large portions. You go to a food restaurant and they actually give you an incentive to size it up. Don't you love when you go to the food place, you know, in the drive-in, not that I ever do this, and you say, I want a number one from Chick-fil-A, and it could be scrambled eggs and God knows what, and they say, well, you, wanna, you want some fries with that? You want a Coke with that? It's like, no, I just want one I ordered. Well, you, it's only 20 cents more, and they got you hooked. So I laugh and I say, no, and if they don't ask me, I say, and by the way, I don't want French fries and Coke with that, thank you. So they just kind of look at me. But anyway, um, and then watch out about the marketing magic, the colors, the shapes, the varieties, the Cinnabons, you know, with the layering on top and the huge sizes of it. Um, I think the next slide is we, we want to get you involved. Yes. So keep in mind as we go along, if you need to use the restroom or anything, you are more than welcome to go up and head that direction. But we're going to get back into the, to the, uh, presentation because we don't want to go too far over. Um, so any thoughts as we kind of talk about the, the pleasure reward system in the brain, a lot of the highly palatable, highly concentrated foods, any thoughts that you guys have, any examples that you recognize as maybe something that you struggle with or have seen others struggle with in the past? Yes. 
Definitely. I can, I can tell you from my own experience and from other people's, what, and also Maria, I'm sh I know you can. I didn't hear the question. Uh, the question is that um, can you really get these pleasure feelings oh. from natural food? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Yes. When you say natural, yeah. um, <coughs> whole food. You mean the, I know, the I know you. Oh. Yeah, right. You mean, I know, I know who you are. I know just what you mean because we've talked about this for decades now. Whole food, real food. Real food is designed to be perfectly in balance for the creature, the human species that we are. And when we eat real food with the original nutrient balance to it, and we eat that way over and over again, <coughs> we do have pleasure. <coughs> the, the most fun thing is when, again, you have desensitized from the highly palatable artificial sweeteners and intense um, salty and, and combination foods, when you start taking those out, then all of a sudden your taste comes back, your brain chemistry starts slowly working um, in balance again. And yeah, a sweet potato is sweet. Onions are sweet. Um, vegetables are highly palatable. Anything that you've seen, even with your diet, natural whole food together, can give great pleasure. It's when we start doing all of these foods, the, the Oreos, the potato chips, the layers, the concentration, the, um, um, the, the combinations, the Parmesan pep, uh, peppercorn Asian pan with this added and that, that our brain doesn't know how to register that. We are out of whack. That dopamine reward system is just at a much higher level. We're not, making, we're not even making our own um, neurotransmitters, mm -hmm. and the receptors are not working properly. We need and want and need and want more and more something from an outside source. It talks a lot about the tolerance. What, what, what Thank Valerie's you. really touching on is the tolerance that happens within our own system as our chemicals become more out of whack, that we need um, a higher level of XYZ to achieve that effect. So it goes back to that addiction process of, you know, I might be able to get a little buzz off of one beer, but after a month or so, I'm going to need two beers, then a six pack, then, you know, wherever that takes mm -hmm. it to. Um, so it really talks a lot about also the tolerance piece as well. Yes. And when I have patients in my nutrition talk say, well, is there a problem if I use 12 um, equal in my already sweetened iced tea? Is that a problem? And I, I kind of laugh and I bring it out to the audience. I say, well, what do you think? And some of them say, well, no, because for them, that's real. Or um, is, it is it unnatural to put salt in my Campbell's soup or to put salt on my ham sandwich? Um, Valerie, also, yes. it's, this is also very critical. Is, um, it really is, and I'm going to pass out the food, the, a food addiction scale yeah. in just a minute. But at the end of the day, it is unique to every individual. I certainly have people who come in to see me who can have a little bite of pizza, a half a slice, and they're fine, mm -hmm. okay? But, or they could have one Oreo, but they cannot have one spoonful of ice cream. So it really is unique to the individual, and that's why it is very important to assess, and, and there is a food addiction scale that helps us to do that, um, because people will say, well, I have to eat, so you know, how am I gonna do this? How's this gonna work exactly? Well, there is a way that it works, and, um, and essentially, I'm getting a little bit into treatment, I'll talk about it more, but essentially, it really, it, like I said, it's unique to the individual and it depends what their trigger foods are or those foods that they are addicted to. Um, and there is a way to work within, within them. Are there any other questions or any, or any just, con yes, 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 sir. You know, we're not going to, there is, there is an obesity gene, yes. So there, there is the genetic component. But most people that I have seen, um, I think one, we've tested one person, there was, it came back negative. Um, so for the most part, you are dealing with more, you know, learning, be, learned behavior and, and that type of issue as opposed to genetics. But there can be, there is an obesity gene, yes. And the, yes. Um, I have type 2 diabetes. Yes. And I cannot wait to go on vacation this summer to my wife's country. And, and I'm looking forward to enjoying their food. Okay? When I go there, I, can, I go off my medication for diabetes. I eat more than I normally eat <laughs> for breakfast, lunch, and supper. And I lose weight. And my sugar levels are 
normal. And why is that? Because none of the food I eat is where I want to go with you. <laughs> well, you're, uh, right. Well, what did you just end with? <laughs> none of the food I eat is processed. Right. It's all natural. You go to the market, you, you buy right. your meat off the table. You, you know, the foods and the breads and everything they make, there's nothing, there's no high fructose sugar in it. Right. And I can eat their, their ice creams, and I can eat their baked goods. You know, with us, but I eat a bigger breakfast there than I eat supper here. Absolutely. And you know, and our focus today is food addiction, but certainly, and, and it's interesting that you talk about another country because there are, and I'll get into it later, there are a lot of mediators for this issue. You know, at the end of the day, we are looking for energy balance. Um, and food addiction is one of multiple mediators, yet a critical, critical mediator to treatment. Um, so what you're talking about involves an environmental mediator. It sounds like you're a lot more physically active when you're there. Um, certainly your, your food, you know, and for type 2 diabetes, on that script from a doctor, you will see exercise. I mean, and we, and for the most part, a lot of people that I get in my clinic are um, pretty sedentary. Um, for instance, and it, Williamsburg has um, a big, there's a big retirement community here. So I see, I have people that'll come in and they are in front of a computer eight hours a day. I'll get pedometers on patients the second or third time I see them. Um, a low level of activity is considered about 3,000 steps. And I have people who will come in at about 800 steps to start, if that. Um, so because they do have, there are a lot of orthopedic issues. In, on my team, I have exercise physiologists, and um, we can't even get them to exercise. I mean, aside from having to do some of the counseling work, um, they might have to do physical therapy before we could even move into exercise. So that's why that individualization, the, that it, this is a unique, unique to every individual, is so critical. You, you know, you have the type 2 diabetes, so the, the carbs need to be watched. I mean, there's things that need to be watched. I had another patient. Um, who definitely struggled with food addiction. Um, so you want to do high protein, you want to watch the carbohydrate, you know, the, the bad carbs, so to speak. But he had stage four uh, liver disease. And so this particular person couldn't eat protein or high, high. So it was a, and that's why the team is so important, is because you really do need the food expert and you do need the counseling and, and so that's what works and of course exercise is, is a is a, a key component to to treatment and, and I'll and, get into and that one later. last thing it sounds like when you were away you weren't as stressed as perhaps you might be here for whatever reason you were enjoying where you were and remember we are we live in a very stressful world which has its own uh, issues and what happens physiologically and emotionally to us for you know craving so Sounds like a, a lovely vacation for you on many levels. What country? Peru. Ooh, nice. Ooh. They have alcohol. Yes. Uh, who asked me? Okay. Right. Any That's other lovely. questions or comments? We have the, yes. the, the, the grade scale on the picture. Um, no, oh. not with us. We'll go over it later. But you can pull it up online, right? You can get it. Yeah, online. and I use it, um, and it's actually, um, it is it is a published scale, but it's not um, looked up. It, it is, it, you can yeah. pull it up online. And I'll show you, and I'll kind of explain how, I, how I've how i worked with it. Um, anything else? Any comments? Okay. Or? Good. Hold it on. Is that you? Or that's still you? It's oh. It, it is, oh, it's still me. Okay, it's still me. Oh, you, yeah, can, okay, one last yeah. slide, and then you can have these two beautiful women. Um, so food addiction. So let's get back to the whole reason why we're here. What is a kind of a working definition of food addiction? It's the consumption of highly palatable foods, which will induce the release of what we call the bliss chemicals, the opioids and the cannabinoids. Ultimately, um, having dopamine being excreted, our pleasure center is, is highly active at that point. They work in concert with dopamine to activate the brain's reward system, producing powerful reinforcement. So now we go, da 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 da, addiction. Maria, oh, Cara. Lovely. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> I did a lot. Here, you. Okay, so first, before, so now this is sort of, sort of the kind of the drier stuff. 
But um, so food addiction theory. So food addiction theory proposes that people can become addicted to food in ways similar to drugs and alcohol. Um, it can lead to overeating, which can result in an increase in body weight um, or obesity in some individuals. Um, there are many clinical accounts in which self-identified food addicts use foods to self-medicate. Um, certainly, a lot of individuals eat to self-regulate. When I have obesity patients come in, um, there are also issues. The vast majority um, do suffer from vitamin D deficiencies and have uh, energy problems with energy. Um, a lot of people are crashing midday. Um, I also have a lot of adolescents. I have students from the public schools, students from the middle schools that are falling asleep in class. So it's happening all across the board. Um, and oh, you can't really see that there. But the last thing, uh, the last thing says, um, people eat to fulfill or to fill a basic human need. You know, and a lot of times, this is where my the program that I designed for this health system was psychologically driven, because as people came in, even on intake, sometimes I would just kind of stop. A lot of people tend to know Maslow and the, that hierarchy of needs, and so what I would do with people is we would talk about you know, what's going on, what, you know, what are you deprived of right now, what are we, so, so we would go through, you know, is it a physiological need, is something unstable, especially in our country in the last few years, there are a lot of financial insecurities and financial instabilities and people are really stressed out over that. And so they're eating to, to cope with that. Um, as we all know, two of the most dominant coping mechanisms are avoidance and eating. So, um, so it's really important to work with your clients to figure out what's going on here and you know, what are the things that we need to problem solve instead of um, using food to cope. And that's just such a, a, a key component to, to treatment. And that's where the counselors are, are so important. Okay, so as far as the obesity, or as far as food addiction goes, there are actually two different schools of thought um, that are in the literature right now and all still being debated. But the first view basically says that um, it is an addiction such like a, like a cocaine addiction. They, they are saying that there are actually addictive properties in the foods themselves. So people are becoming addicted to the actual food. So it is kind of like a cocaine or an alcohol. The second view proposes that um, it is more a process addiction, that the food itself is not addictive, but it's more like a marijuana, it's a habitual drug. Um, so what, what happens here is they're saying that, you know, hey, eating and food, these are benign things. Or, and at one point, things like sex or buying, th using money to buy things, these are all benign behaviors also. This school of thought says that people go throughout their lives and they eat just like they might have sex, just like they might, you know, go to Vegas once in a while. Um, but at some point something happens and these benign behaviors kind of cross the line into an addiction. So then it becomes habitual and it's what people turn to to cope and they get caught up in, in the habit. And that's, where, that's how the addiction comes about. So those are sort of the two, the two views out there right now. Uh, three stages of the food addiction model. Binging. So this is a bout of intake in a relatively short period of time, typically following abstinence or deprivation of food. Withdrawal. And this is, this is the discussion on how it starts to mimic addiction. Signs that can become apparent when the abuse substance is no longer available or chemically blocked. Um, craving occurs when the motivation to obtain a certain substance such as these highly palatable foods, is enhanced usually after a period of prolonged abstinence. Okay, criteria pertaining to substance abuse have been applied to food addiction. Um, I just gave you a copy of the, or you were passed around the copy of the Yale Food Addiction Scale, which you have it, but I'm, I'm still gonna talk about it in just a little bit later. Um, clinical studies have shown that food craving in normal weight and obese patients activates areas of the brain similar to those indicated in drug cravings. And, um, and the research and literature on this is just M MRI and imaging, a lot of imaging studies. Um, 
Evidence of food addiction. Uh, there are clinical similarities between uh, obesity, binge eating disorder, and, um, and drug addiction. There's evidence of shared vulnerability to both obesity and substance addiction. There is evidence of tolerance, withdrawal, and compu compulsive food seeking in animal models of overexposure to high sugar and or high density fatty foods. Sodium, high density sodium is the other one that for some reason isn't up here. Um, evidence of lower levels of dopamine receptors, the D2s, like drug addiction patients, are found in obese um, individuals. And there is evidence of altered brain responses to food-related stimuli in obese individuals compared with non-obese control in, uh, in the imaging studies I referenced. Okay, so these are just some, we just wanted to show you parallels between drug addiction and food addiction. So there are some co comorbid symptoms up here. I think there, when I read it over, a couple things seemed to overlap. But um, there is an escalation of use. So I'm not really going to go over the sub substance dependence part. You can read it. But for food addiction and binge eating disorder, because we kind of have to go with that right now, um, as counselors, uh, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry. Um, there is a loss of control. And for, for food addiction and eating, there is a sense of lack of control during episodes. Example, a, feel, a feeling that one can't stop eating or control what or how much one is eating. Um, and, I, and this is what I get all the time. I have people who eat secretly. I have kids who will go upstairs to their rooms. Parents will find, I mean, it just, Time and time again, uh, you, d you definitely get the loss of control. Social consequences, people eat alone because they're, they're embarrassed. Uh, activities are given up. There's almost like a co cognitive resonance that happens as people start to become obese. Well, I didn't want to participate in that anyway. I didn't want to go there anyway. A lot of times I have people come in and they'll say, I mean, I had a someone who had to go inter internationally to meet someone of great importance and was really looking forward to it and ended up not going because she just didn't like the way she looked in anything. And so, I mean, it, it's a, it's, there are a lot of uh, social consequences for people. Moms who say, I, my kids want me to go ride bikes with them and I'm too embarrassed for someone to see me sitting on a bike yeah. with my kids. Um, so lots of accounts there. Personal distress, um, feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or feeling very guilty after overeating. Marked distress regarding binge eating, eating until feeling uncomfortably full. And of course, this might be a good time to, to, to say that binge eating disorder and food addiction certainly does not, does not just affect the overweight and obese population. There are plenty of people of normal weight or even underweight that binge eating and food addiction affects. It's just that in obesity, there are no compensatory behaviors such as purging, such as overexercising, such as you know maybe periods of starvation. Um, so there are other things that happen. This doesn't just affect this population. Um, tolerance, increasing the amount of food that's required to reach. You know this is this is also really interesting. But to speak to one of the mediators. Um, just again, look at what look at what uh, I just saw on the news a couple of days ago that Taco Bell is now doing breakfast. Did you see that? Uh, did you see the breakfast? <laughs> so they're doing bacon and eggs and syrups and in a waffle, and they're rolling it up in a waffle to make. So they're calling it these breakfast tacos. It is it is unbelievable. So they're just layering and layering and layering. Uh, these high density foods now, and people are building up the tolerance. There's withdrawal. There's definitely a lot of stress when you're trying to go on a on a diet, so to speak. Um, time, great deal of time is spent eating. A great deal of time is spent thinking about food. Obsession. Yes. Um, continued use despite consequences, which you find in drugs, and you also find in in food. Uh, overeating is maintained despite knowledge of adverse physical and psychological consequences caused by excessive food consumption. That's you, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about food addiction scale? Or you gonna, or did you um, I'll talk about it later okay. during treatment. So, um, as we, is there a question? 
So as we start to take a look at it, one of the things that's been really helpful for me in identifying food as part of an addictive process is comparing it to substance abuse or chemical dependency. So we're going to take a look at how this actually compares to substance abuse and dependence. So I did throw on here just the DSM criteria for substance abuse. Uh, for those of you who don't work on it every day like I do, I forget that some folks um, don't always have kind of what the DSM criteria are. Um, so this one is for substance abuse. Um, so this is not dependence, it's the step before that. Um, but it's the maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress um, by any of those following ones. So a lot of the negative consequences that start to come up. When we take a look at dependence, um, it's looking at that significant impairment or distress by three or more of the following. So we talk about the tolerance, um, the need for, for more, um, a diminished effect if I use the same amount. Uh, we look at withdrawal, um, persistent desire to, to cut down but being unable to. Um, a great deal of time is spent in the activity, so we're looking at the obsession. I'm thinking about it. When's my next use? How am I going to find it? Where is it going to be? How am I going to use it? How do I get rid of it? How do I hide it? Someone found my hiding spot. Same thing we talk a lot about with um, folks who really struggle with that obsession around food. When's the next time I'm going to eat? Is my significant other going to find out that I, that I ate all the candy again? Do I need to buy candy to replace it? You know, my candy jar. It, uh, um, for me, after Halloween or um, Christmas, I'm like, oh, i got to get to Rite Aid because all the candy 75% off. It's a great rationale, right? I mean, I'll put it in my office. My patients can have it. And I think I eat probably 90% of it if I do that. Um, and so we're taking a look at all these components for substance dependence. So I like this slide. I suffer from overeating and manic depression. I've got my happy meal and my sad meal. Um, so taking a look at how we really are utilizing food as a mood-altering substance. Um, so just like cocaine, alcohol, heroin, opiates, benzos, all of those are um, mood altering in terms of either not, uh, numbing out, not wanting to feel, not wanting to experience. We also utilize food as a mood altering substance as well. So let's break it down into the disease model. So if we're taking a look at substance abuse as a disease model, it's primary, progressive, chronic disease. It's a family disease, um, not just kind of biologically, but we take a look at if, if people take a look at their family trees, um, you know, people say, well, nurture versus nature. A lot of folks, depending on the environment that you grow up in, are exposed to more drugs and alcohol. Some aren't exposed to it at all. So there's a part of, it's kind of this mystical substance, or it's always there, it's always part, it's, it's a norm. Um, we have dependence and withdrawal symptom, symptoms. There's a complex etiology, so we talk about it as a bio, psycho, social, and spiritual disease. Relapsing is very common. Remembering relapse happens way before a person takes their next use, and so we'll get into that in terms of the food part as well. So there's that manipulating, the hiding, the avoidance, all of those defenses that tend to pop up. Um, some of the effects of the disease are irreversible. So we talk about cirrhosis. We can prevent further damage, but a lot of times we can't reverse the damage that's already been done. We have to just function with what's going on with that, which is why um, that kind of multi multidisciplinary model becomes really important. Um, it is potentially fatal. We know that if, if it's left untreated, folks do die from this disease every day. Um, but full sustained recovery is real and possible. Well, if we take a look at the disease concept for um, eating disorders and food addiction, it's the same exact thing. It's a primary progressive chronic disease. You know, we talked about in the beginning how folks are living to a much longer age, and a lot of these um, effects of food addiction, overeating, obesity, um, in terms of the autoimmune disorders, the depression, the anxiety, um, the, the increased risk of cancers, all of that is that chronic disease that is definitely poten potentially fatal. Um, I actually, uh, I didn't introduce myself, I'm Cara. I do the food and mood group here and I work with a lot of the folks that have either a history of eating disorder or um, uh, body image issues, difficult relationships with food. Um, so I run a group over there and so a lot of my kind of um, work in this field is more of the eating disorder uh, and substance abuse. And, but for me when I talk about eating disorders, I put them under the addiction umbrella because it all kind of falls in. So when you hear me say eating disorder or talk about it, I'm really relating that to food addiction. Um, some of the effects of the disease are irreversible, so we've got like osteoporosis or the damage that we do to our organs or to our muscles. A lot of times those things, depending on where you are in age, aren't always able to be repaired or to be repaired to 100% of what you were kind of as a kid or an adolescent. Um, it is potentially fatal. There's a significant morbidity and mortality rate 
to this disease with, um, when we're talking about eating disorders, I think it's the highest mortality rate of all mood disorders, psychological disorders, if I'm saying it correctly. And of course, full and sustained recovery is real and possible for the patient and the family. So in terms of the disease concept, they are exactly parallel. They fit really well. Um, and Columbia University, uh, in a study done there, is it shows that a lot of this actually is very intertwined and linked. So a lot of folks that um, struggle with eating disorders, 50%, also abuse alcohol and drugs compared to 9% of the general population. And 35% of um, alcohol or drug users have eating disorders compared to 3% of the general population. So it's actually really important that we tie these together because there is a lot of co-occurring or comorbid situations going on between them. So Carolyn Ross, um, who's a researcher, stated there's eight surprising parallels between food and drug addiction. And we talked a little bit about them before, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. So we talk about the effects on the brain reward system. Um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine continues to broaden their definition of addiction. So they're now starting to include more of what we consider the process addiction. So food, sex, gambling, exercise, thrill-seeking, shopping, all of those are starting to kind of filter their way into ASAM's criteria of addiction. Um, so one of the big ones coming in, of course, is food. Um, both drugs, food, and the behaviors can flood the brain with dopamine, causing that increased pleasure. Also taking a look at less self-control. When we talk about addiction, I talk about the three marked components of it, the impulsivity, compulsivity, and continued use despite negative consequences. A lot of times when I, a patient says, I'm not really sure if I have addiction, I'm not really sure if food's a big part of it or if, or if uh, my behaviors are a big part of it, I just ask them to break it down into those three criteria because it's a really simple way to take a look at it. Um, and we talk about how over time the structure of the brain can actually change, impacting our body's natural functioning on dopamine release and, and or uptake. So I think someone had asked um, during discussion, can, can natural foods give us that high? But we talk about how when we continue to put into our systems different um, chemicals or, or creating different pathways, neural pathways to processing, it starts to kind of cut this groove in our brain that we settle into. So um, has anyone here seen Pleasure Unwoven? It's a really great video kind of breaking down addiction in very simple layman's terms. But one example that I really like that he utilizes is the idea of canyons. Canyons form over time. The river running through it starts to carve a pathway. And as the canyon gets deeper, the river is not really going to deviate from that pathway. Um, and so what we talk about is our patterns, our brain systems, the way we think and process, if we stay in one thing over time, it builds kind of more of those deeper ravines. That's what makes change really hard because habits are really difficult to break. So we have to first break a habit and then create a new one. So we have to create then new canyons, new ravines that we have to go into. That's what makes change really difficult. Um, and so part of this process and making the differences is, is taking a look at how do I make behavioral change. So a lot of that cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of that talk therapy becomes important. And we talk about foods high in fat, sugar, sodium, release those endogenous opioids. So we are kind of giving ourselves a natural high. And we talk about cravings. Um, so due to brain changes, compulsive eaters may have cravings for junk foods for their next high, very similar to addicts. And so a lot of studies that they've done on rats actually show that they do prefer the, um, have tendencies to binge on sugary drinks when available, and in fact are now showing in the brain that they activate the reward system at a higher level than cocaine does. Um, so it's, it's actually showing how this is um, showing a lot of uh, similarities between the way it works in the brain. Um, Maria talked a little bit about brain imaging. Have you guys heard of fMRIs? It's that picture of the brain that's got all the really fun colors. It's like blue and red, and it shows the different parts of the brain that are active. And they've shown for addicts, when you put them in the um, MRI machine and you show them pictures of their drug of choice, there's little parts of their brain that kind of light up. Well, what they've done with folks who struggle with food addiction is when they show them the same pictures of food, um, the same areas of the brain are actually lighting up. And it's showing that the, the parts of the brain are very similar. Now, the pathway to kind of get that ding to go up goes differently. I think Maria was telling me about that, is when you take drugs, it kind of goes right to the brain, like, woo -hoo. Um, but when you have the food, it has to go down into the stomach, to the intestine, and then up to the brain. <sighs> you could, was I close? <laughs> she just taught me that one. I got really excited. Um, 
So it, it is kind of still stimulating the same parts of the brain, different pathways to get there, but still the same areas of the brain that are being activated. We talk about tolerance and withdrawal. So obviously withdrawal is much more uh, evident in folks who struggle with drug addiction. You've got the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, the tremors, the shakes, the sweating, all the really fun stuff that our patients go through here when they come in. Um, but we also take a look at there is withdrawal symptoms in us when we are taking away the foods that, um, that Val has been talking about, the highly palatable, the intense um, sugars, carbohydrates, fats. Um, and a lot of times that's the irritability, that agitation, the anxiety. So you guys ever seen a friend on a diet and it's like their first weekend and they're like, do not eat in front of me because I'll kill you. Or they're about to lunge across and take your lunch from you. Or they're just kind of irritable in general. Um, I know for me, when I don't eat, I like to joke, I have Cara feeding time. When I miss Cara feeding time, I get hanger, that hungry anger. <laughs> well, you know, uh, also real quick to piggyback on what you just said, yeah. one thing that I don't even think we have a slide for that is also really important is there, there is a critical gender component to this. Um, so that, gosh, we didn't think to put a slide in, but, but just know working with female, uh, a female population, typically, not every time, is very different than working with a male population. Because when you bring in the multiple mediators and then in treatment have the multiple components, mm -hmm. how you're going to work with the different genders um, present very differently. So Absolutely. I just wanted to yeah. bring that up. So we talk about denial. So in drug addicts and, and alcoholics, it takes a look at it's not that bad, I can stop when I want. When we talk about food addictions, I just like to eat. Eating's normal. It's not that much food anyways. So-and-so ate just as much at the family reunion also. Didn't you see them? So there's still that level of denial that's there. We continue to underestimate the number of calories that we eat and how much we weigh. Another component, too, that I was joking about is I always overestimate how much calories I burned at the gym. Yeah, I was on the treadmill for like 20 minutes. Obviously, I burned 500 calories, right? <laughs> and so we, we trick ourselves. That's that level of denial. Um, so we have to require change of behaviors and our routines to begin to see results. And that's the same, like I said, with, with substance abuse. We have to change our behaviors and routines to see results. If I'm a, an alcoholic, it's probably not good that I still go to the pub every day just to get lunch. It's probably not a good idea. And so I have to change my behaviors, my routines, to see long-term results. The multiple unsuccessful attempts to quit or cut down. So both have significant tendencies to relapse. And like we saw in that um, trailer for Hungry for Change, about 95% of people who lose weight will gain it back in then some. So typically it's not that you're gaining back what you lost, you're typically gaining a little bit more than that. Um, one of the big things that we see here in treatment is gastric bypass. Um, folks that either have had gastric bypass, and about 25% who have gastric bypass will develop chemical dependency. Part of that is the physiological changes that happen within the body. You get drunk faster, it, it metabolizes faster through your system, and so if you want to keep that high, you have to keep drinking, and then you build a tolerance to it, and it's just a real slippery slope. Because remember, a lot of folks who go into that surgery haven't had the emotional processing to deal with the idea of mood altering with food, and then we take away the food, and they go with the next thing that they know they can mood alter with, which is t typically alcohol. I want to keep speaking. I didn't know when, but um, <clears throat> it's very interesting in food and mood group that our patients are very comfortable talking about their, their drugs, yeah. how they used it, when they did everything. But many of them never talked about their issues with food and their relationship to food. And it, it's just so freeing for them to be able to talk in a in a, in a private room, confidential space, to actually get the words out. And it's life changing. And, and I didn't realize that, but you can talk about drugs all you want, but to talk about food addiction, food issues, very, very different. Such a stigma. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so, stigma. Oh, <laughs> stigma. I forgot it was right there. Um, comes from many sources. So, we've got society, we've got media, we've got family and friends. And a lot of this leads to that secrecy, the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment. When we talk about um, recovery, we talk about learning how to deal with our core issues that come up. And a lot of that can be that guilt, shame, embarrassment, inadequacy, um, rejection. So there's a lot of stigma. In terms of um, uh, how media is changing, we're, there's a lot more shows now or um, movies about chemical dependency. You know, it's not uncommon to see people um, under the influence or trying to get into recovery. There's a lot, actually a lot more of those movies starting to come out, but there's not a lot on food addiction and overeating. And in fact, when we look at the media, 
uh, and you look at kind of some of the hit shows that are out there, um, you know, you have the slender lead role, and then you kind of have that um, larger, funny best friend. I think you were talking about Pitch Perfect as an example. Um, but how that person, the, the larger person, never really is the one that has the love interest. They're the funny person. That's the character that they play. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot in my group is, well, there's an association with if I'm fat, then I must be fat, lazy, and stupid. Um, and so we have to really break some of that stigma that we carry. Um, a lot of times, medical providers don't have the education or training on how to properly intervene, so they don't know how to approach talking about being overweight or what weight loss might, might be like because my experiences, and, and when I first started this work, is I was really afraid of offending someone. I didn't want them to be mad at me. I didn't want to embarrass them so that they didn't come back for treatment. So it's how do I continue to bring it in there where they feel safe enough to talk about it and to come back and continue treatment. Um, and weight bias is still very prevalent in a lot of areas. So, you know, we talk about um, the stigma and, and drug abuse. That's starting to decrease a little bit, but the weight bias is still very much there. Um, continued use despite negative consequences, a lot of loss of control. So we've got legal issues, family and relationships, loss of job. We also talk about heart disease, diabetes, lower immune system, relationship issues. Because when we're talking a lot about um, the manipulation, the hiding, uh, that will ne definitely negatively impact your ability to have healthy relationships. There's also, um, you know, and as a, as a counselor, when you're working with this, a lot of times when people come in, um, there are many folks who suffer from sleep apnea, for instance. Mm -hmm. So um, if they're on there, if they're doing their, they're taking their CPAP machine and doing it, great. They're probably coming in with a, an adequate amount of sleep. Most people that come in, like I said, are vitamin D deficiency or um, they're insom they, they have insomnia um, and are really, really struggling with that energy piece. So sometimes before I, and this is where it's so critical to have a team of folks, um, I have to either get their sleep behavior going so that we have a constant sleep time, a constant wake time, and really work behaviorally with them. And if I can't seem to do it, I'll have to pull in a primary care. Do we need a sleep aid here? Um, so before we could even get to the food in many cases and deal with the weight or the obesity, we have to deal with you know, the underlying psychological issues and the underlying medical issues that might accompany the, um, that, the food addiction issue. Absolutely. Um, and the prevalence of co-occurring disorders. About 50% of those who struggle with drug addiction and substance dependence also have things like depression, anxiety, ADHD. Um, but it's also found in research that it's common for compulsive eaters to also have depression and or ADD, ADHD. Um, so social anxiety is also a big piece of it. Um, like we go back to that mood altering piece of, of when I'm in a social situation, um, a lot of times, well, if I have something in my hand, I feel safer, I feel more comfortable. If I'm eating, then no one can talk to me. So there's that piece, that, that uh, mental piece that goes on with it as well. And so these are just some other commonalities. Um, they tend to occur in times of transition or stress, um, common brain chemistry, common family history. So I talk about that in terms of uh, if you grow up in a home where drug addiction is prevalent, it's, it's normed, it's kind of, um, it's, it's a little bit more okay, or people do it, I can rationalize a little bit better around it. When you grow up in a home where diet's the fad, when everyone's always dieting, or someone's always talking about what they're eating, or there's always comments being made about weight, it becomes that norm. And so for a lot of folks, they don't realize that, hey, maybe it actually isn't a normal thing that everybody talks about all the time. Maybe that's my only perception of that. Um, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, um, there tends to be a history of abuse within there, um, unhealthy parental behaviors and low monitoring of children's activities, um, unhealthy peer norms and social pressures, and susceptibility to messages from media. Um, so, um, to, to piggyback on that for a quick second, for those of you who do get referrals from physicians, you know, when I, in my role as a health psychologist, yes, I do clinical work, but a big part of my job is, is talking with them and educating them. And, and they really miss that biopsychosocial piece. And for, for a lot, primary carers get it and they want to do it. What I tell them is, is I get it. Managed care is the way that it is. You don't have the time and the resources to do this, but I do. You know, let me, so, because what happens is, not just the lose weight, because they do, they might say, you know, oh, well, you know, let's try to get some of the weight off, but sometimes they'll say to their patients, okay, you've got to get more sleep, or you've got to get that stress level down. 
And so the patients leave the doctor's office feeling completely disempowered. They have no idea how to do it. And so that's what's so critical is for, is to, for those of you who, you know, who get referrals from the medical field, nurses, and doc, you know, talk to them and say, look, you know, it's, it's a lot more than just telling your patient, lower your stress. I mean, they know that. Um, but tell them, you know, where are the resources in order to be able to do this properly. How so. to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They just don't know how. But some other similarities. Um, there's also the idea of how it still works on the cortical hypofrontality. Um, so that frontal cortex, which does a lot on decision making, problem solving, rational thinking, and both addictions, forms of addiction, that definitely gets impacted. Um, there are some differences. Um, the definition of abstinence um, requires a high level of clinical sophistication. So it talks about the individualized planning for those with food addiction. Abstinence doesn't work with food addiction. We can't just say, don't eat, you'll be okay. It doesn't work that way. Um, but there's certain pieces of abstinences that you can have, and that's why the individualized part is really important. Yeah. Okay. Should I talk about the, the, the I might just yeah. actually earlier talk about this, the food addiction. Oh, do we pass it out? Yes. Everyone yes. has it? Okay, on this food addiction scale, when I work, when I do intake on, um, you know, obesity, for instance, um, one of the things that you're going to see on this scale is at the very end, number 26, um, it actually lists some foods uh, right here. And so some people get in there and they might circle, you know, pizza. They have problems with pizza and they have problems with bacon and, and whatnot. So, and then they list other foods. I do work within a 12-step model. Um, and so there is abstinence. If there, if there is a food that has been circled or if there is a food that has been listed as problematic, especially when I look at the front, of this, and they put um, that four or more times a day, their behavior with regard to that food is causing them significant distress. You better believe that when I work with my teammate, who's a registered dietitian, that I, the psychologist, will will go to her and say, "Don't you dare <laughs> put you know this little teeny portion of pizza." Because um, while Valerie is a dietitian who definitely gets it, and she's awesome, there are a lot of registered dietitians and physicians out there who don't get it. Um, they think portion control, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, the first dietitian I ever worked with, you know, was giving sort of an ADA type diet, and at the end of the night, I had a, I had a, actually a 30-year recovered alcoholic who, in, um, in in rehab out in California saw a little candy bowl, he said, and it all started there with his food addiction, who came to me at about 350 pounds when he was referred. And that dietitian put a 100-calorie snack pack of Oreos at the end of the night for him. And I just said, we can't do this with him. There has to be abstinence. This is a big trigger food for him. So there's, it's been interesting getting this team to evolve and really getting other professionals to understand this concept of, of food addiction and that there are certain foods that are abstinent. And that's what, um, and I'm pretty much at complete abstinence in my practice. I mean, if, if, if it is a problem food, if, if you've crossed the line with that food, um, what are you saying to me? Just are you saying? Keep it away from the Oh, sorry. Um, if, 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 if we've crossed the line with that particular food, it is abstinence in your treatment. That's what it is. So. Um, why, why some of them are on here? You know, interestingly enough, to this day, as much as I've used this, um, lettuce was never circled. I mean, there are just some food. They just they threw it on there. I, I didn't create the scale. I just use it. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to quickly well, speak to that. That talks a lot about the individualized piece, though, because, in, like I said, with substance abuse, we say just don't use, don't use, don't drink just for today. It's not safe to go back. You know, one is too many, a thousand is not enough. When we talk about um, food, we just can't be absent. You have to eat to survive. We just There may be foods that you do have to remain abstinent from. Um, body image distortions tend to be more extreme in uh, food addiction. The impact in median culture, um, there's more of an impact that on eating disorders. And there's a greater female to male prevalence ratio in eating disorders that is starting to shift and change. There's a lot of new research coming out in terms of men and eating disorders. Um, that's a whole other lecture for me. If you guys want it, I'll give it to you. Um, but it's, it's um, historically been greater female to male. Um, there's more stigma. There's less recognition of an eating disorder and food addiction as a brain disease. So a lot of times what you get from others who don't understand is, well, they just need to stop eating so much. They just need to stop throwing up. They just need to, to find, just to not eat that. They'll be fine. 
Um, so there's a lot more denial from others around them as well. Um, and there's different physical signs and symptoms, but definitely multi-organ impairments in each. And there's less availability of 12-step support groups for food and mood issues. So a lot of times, you know, if you find an AA, NA meeting, even Al-Anon, they're kind of a stone's throw away. But when we talk about Overeaters Anonymous, EDA, Eating Disorders Anonymous, ABA is Anorexics Bulimics Anonymous, it is really difficult to find a healthy 12-step group in an area. Williamsburg just kind of got going. They've had an OA meeting around, but it's been once a week and it's been struggling. In the past, I would say, year, it's been picking up and a little bit better, but there's only one around here. I was just working with someone who's going up to the DC area, and actually we were only able to find two meetings in that area that someone could utilize for an eating disorder support group. So it's very, very difficult for them to get that help and support. And also, with, um, with what I used to do for this health system, I ran all of the counseling groups, so every patient was in, was in my groups. But, as, but the, the beauty and the, the, the importance of working as a team is these people not only sat in group with me and supported each other and formed um, you know, sponsors in some cases with each other, but these people also worked out together. So there was a buddy system on the exercise piece. I started a walking group down in, a, for those of you that are from here on Dog Street on Duke of Gloucester. To this day, I'm a runner and I meet downtown and I see people walking that started in my program a year and a half later they're still walking together which is such a joy to see um, so these people are truly getting healthy together as a group so it's not just the counseling it's it's all of it so you want to talk about energy balance? Oh, okay yeah. <laughs> so um, and so again it's really about energy balance um, it and and we focus today on the food addiction piece, but certainly there are multiple mediators um, to energy balance. Um, I just kind of talked about the physical activity really quickly. Um, food environment is critical. As a society in America, to be healthy, we're going against the grain. That's just what it is. Um, as a society, we are not really set up uh, to, to be healthy. Um, energy expenditure, and environmental influences. You kind of spoke to that already, so I'm not gonna go back over it, but we all know what we see and, and you know what it is. Um, appetite, you can kind of take a look at that. There's an insensitive, insensitivity to hunger and fullness. The rate at which we eat, that's another thing that behaviorally I really do work with people on. Um, when people come in and their change state is, well, it could be a child, so they're pre-contemplative. And let's just say that they're kind of in preparation. They're kind of getting ready to eat right and lose some weight. And um, then what I do there is, again, we don't necessarily talk about the food. I'll just say to them, hey, um, how about just don't eat in front of the TV? Let's just start there. Um, or I'll say, hey, you have these orthopedic issues and you can't really move. Let's just get your tennis shoes on. But it's these small changes that eventually you know, lead, lead them down the road. And it takes time. In my program, we follow patients for about a year minimum, and they tend to stay for, for a while. So um, the predispositions and the reward circuitry, so all of these things uh, really impact the success of maintaining normal body weight. Um, so this is the multidisciplinary approach to, to treatment, biopsychosocial. The behavioral health piece, yeah. Did you have something? No, I was scratching. Uh, um, so essentially, what at least what I did, it was a psychologically driven um, multidisciplinary program. And the components of the program that I worked with were, um, were nutrition. So I have, a, there was a registered dietitian, and then I did the counseling work and we ultimately brought on um, two other counselors. Um, we, I worked with a team of physical therapists and I also worked with a team of um, fitness instructors. And then medicine is another key component. And, um, real quick, I'll speak to medicine because we've, you know, obviously covered a lot of the behavioral health. But the medical piece is also really important because a lot of because there are um, co-occurring uh, or or dual diagnoses with anxiety or with depression. And you know, if any of these things are happening, and um, you know, for instance, if you can't get someone to calm down, you will need to bring in a psychiatrist or their primary care to to deal with that before you're really dealing with the issue of food and losing weight because 
it's just not going to happen. In other cases, for the food addiction itself, I have some people, or I've had some people, that the food addiction is so strong. Um, I mean, they come in with, you know, let's say type 2 diabetes or fatty livers, but the food addiction is so strong, they really can't do it on their own. There are um, pharmacological options for these patients. And, um, and as long as, when I work with the doctors, as long as we see that they are, you know, they have started to exercise, they really want to do this and they're really struggling, there are medications like fentramine, um, to, to, you know, which is an ap appetite suppressant um, prescribed by a doctor. Um, there's another medication called Topamax, which actually um, really helps with the actual binging. So there are, um, a f you know, we don't want to go that route. It's certainly not what we jump to. But if people have been kind of going at it for a while and really, really struggling, um, certainly there are those, those options. Um, There's also the medical piece on the other end, too. So if we have someone coming in with a food addiction, the obsession that's more on the restrictive end, where they overeat and then they restrict for a long time, um, and they're not giving their body proper nutrients, we also have to make sure that the refeeding process is healthy. It's okay that they don't go into shock. Because um, for a lot of them who are very nutrient deprived and maybe a very low weight can actually have a lot of difficulty in um, reintroducing food. So there's also that medical component as well. Um, oh, oh, real quick, for the physical activity piece, again, um, that's critical. They ha people have to exercise. I, when people come in, typically they are very, very sedentary. Um, it's dangerous, and um, and so it really we work with whatever level they come in at. Um, and ag and again, I can't tell you, I can't speak enough to how individualized the entire team will be um, for each and every person that has come through, um, at least the program that I that I designed. So. And there's a lot of acceptance that has to come with that when we talk about that 12-step model, we talk about kind of the emotional processing is accepting where we're at in the moment and in the present. Um, and so really understanding and learning how to trust in our bodies that if I've been very sedentary, I'm probably not going to be able to run and jump to the gym six days a week, two hours a session. That's actually going to cause a lot of negative consequences. So also there's some acceptance around that as well as what can my body handle and what can it, what can it do for me at this present moment. very quickly. I, two, two things though, I also think it's important, um, the whole concept of grieving, saying goodbye to your best friend. I don't know about you all, but some people say when, when I do my um, sessions over, over at Farley, that their best friend for decades has been food. It's their lover, it's their friend, it, it, it's, it's nurtured them, it's helped them, it's been with them. So on some level you have to get them to say those words and understand how unhealthy that relationship is. So I think awareness is really important, and you have to have a relationship with, the, with these clients t that they're comfortable talking about it. Particularly in Williamsburg, um, my clients have to say goodbye to alcohol. A lot of retired people, and they're doing their cocktail hour at 5 o'clock. And they from me, what diet? You know, just tell me what foods I don't have to eat or I should eat, but don't ask me to take that alcohol away because I'm not going to do it. Well, I've lost them, based, you know, so I'll say, okay, instead of five drinks, maybe you go down to four, and we do that slowly. But you really have to get to know everything about your client. Um, as far as nutrition, it's really individualized. I, I, I don't know really what to say. You've got to get to know your client, know their eating habits, um, their, their work situation, how they feel when they go home, how they have been eating, and you have to individualize the meal plan, you know, very minute steps. You want to get healthy food in, Maybe that's what you focus on sometimes. You just get something healthy in while very slowly you're taking away maybe one product or cutting down. Of course, the binge foods, the trigger foods, you have to identify and they do have to say goodbye to those. But healthy meal planning will help to stabilize your blood sugar levels so you're not craving as much either. So we try to have smaller uh, feedings with protein that's balanced throughout the day. And lots of times patients don't want to get fat in their diet because they were trained that fat is bad. But it's okay to eat a bag or a box of, you know, the snack wall cookies that we used to have. So I try to get healthy fats in their diet and let them know how satisfying and satiating that could be. Um, people have to be mindful of what they're eating, what they're tasting. You want them to to be in a calm environment. You want them to chew their food really well, to taste it, to smell it, to look at it, and not be doing a lot of other activities, to be mindful. 
And um, record keeping has helped many people with their moods, their food, their activities. And coming back for follow-up, you cannot see the nutritionist or the counselor or the physical therapist just once. You need to make this a multidisciplinary team approach and work on this and give it time. You're not going to get immediate gratification the first time. That's, that's in a nutshell that I can say. Anything and else? Really yeah. in dealing with the addiction piece, because remember, it's that I want what I want when I want it, yes. and I typically want it now. And so we have to <clears> slow down that process of it takes time, it's not going to be immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. that the, also, the mindfulness piece is, is also key, and meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because, and this is where that gender component really tends to come in, and I see it a lot. In women, as a matter of fact, um, I, I keep in my in my groups. I used to keep my, my women with women, and I had men, men with men. But um, but what I would <laughs> one interesting thing that happened is in my women's group, um, we kind of talked about slowing down and just allowing some time to the, that anxiety piece, just to think. You know, give yourself this carved out time to think about what's going on and what the issues are and to problem solve. And they it, they all looked at each other like everyone had five heads and they kind of go and so this one lady said you know I noticed that my husband just sometimes just he just sits on the chair and just <laughs> and just sits <laughs> and she realized you know he that's his time and you know that I, and, and it was interesting because they really got into that gender component that men are thinkers they tend to think you know it's kind of like that Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. like most mm -hmm. women are feelers we're emotions mm -hmm. we've got a lot going on up here so um so there's an interesting gender component in treatment with with that particular piece so as we yeah. kind of move into that behavioral health piece in terms of the experiential therapies of maybe yoga or uh, working on mindfulness um, we also talk about um, a lot of different ways so cognitive behavioral therapy is a really big one one of the things that I talk about a lot with my um, patients here is utilizing food as a metaphor or identifying the relationship that we have with food. Um, a book that I love is called Eating in the Light of the Moon. It's by Judith Cornell. I think it's Cornell. Um, you can get it on Amazon. I love that book. It really talks a lot about food as a metaphor. So it talks about as we're born from kids, we develop an emotional relationship with food. So it's not just um, a nutritional component to survive. So when we're born and we're babies, we're fed, right? So how are babies usually fed? Like this, right? So if they're breastfed or ball fed. So this creates what? What do you think this feels like for a child? Security, comfort, warmth, care. Um, you know, we go to the doctor's office when we're kids and we get a shot. What typically comes after that? Lollipop, right? Yeah. Your lollipop. Oh, I'm hurting. Oh, hey, look, sugar makes that pain go away. So we develop these relationships with food from a very young age that continues on. So I talk a lot about if you grew up in a um, home where it's the clean your plate club, where um, I've had patients say, man, I refuse to eat it. I hated that food. And I sat at the dinner table for four hours and probably had to eat it for breakfast the next day before I could do anything else. And what that creates is a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of anger and frustration. I had a patient that came through last year. She had gone through that um, with her own body image issues on top of that, but when she was a kid, she had that clean your plate club and there was such pressure to do that and such negative consequences that now as a mother of two, she makes the meal in the kitchen. She brings it to the table and as her two sons and her husband are eating, she goes in the kitchens and clean, kitchen and cleans it up. She can't even handle sitting at the table because of the anxiety that it produces and her fear of implementing that on her two children because she knew how damaging that was for her. Um, so there's these very difficult relationships that get brought up with food that we do have to address as clinicians. And so, yeah, for a lot of folks, it's my best friend, it's my confidant, it's the one person who never let me down. My friends may not be available, but that pint of ice cream is or that bag of Doritos is. It never lets me down. I always feel good after I eat it. So it's breaking that relationship of a friendship, of a best friend, um, and, and kind of taking a look at, well, what's the new relationship that I need to develop with food? And so a lot of times I'll also have them write a goodbye letter to their food. So actually writing the goodbye out and presenting it in group. Um, we talk a lot about um, what is healthy and I have them identify their perception of healthy first and then we break it down into what healthy really is. Taking, the, taking them outside the idea of a number. So the weight number isn't as important, the BMI isn't as important that we learn to kind of identify what else is healthy. So we bring in the emotional health, the mental health, the spiritual health 
all of that component, bringing that ideation into what healthy is. Um, so it's a lot of challenging the relationships that we do have with food. 12-step programs also bring a lot of acceptance. Um, we have to look at the unmanageability as well. If we don't recognize what the negative consequences are, we're not going to find that drive to make a change. So I do have to develop acceptance that this is something that I struggle with and that my life really is unmanageable. If my obsession is around food all the time and I eat my breakfast in the morning and I go to work and I think, okay, well, what's for lunch? I wonder what's for lunch today. If I don't like that, what can I have? Oh, look, there's my Hershey Kisses in my desk drawer. I think I'll have a couple of those today. And I have that obsession. Well, it's taking me out of being in the moment. I'm no longer present in myself and I'm kind of hyper focused on something else. So I have to develop awareness and acceptance of, oh, this maybe isn't so healthy or it's not really working for me. And then I can create change after that. So the 12-step model is also very important as well. Experiential therapies like um, body, uh, body movement or dance movement. Um, my experience in working with the patients that I do is we become two separate entities. I have my physical entity, which is just kind of me and my physical body, and I have my mental and emotional um, entity. And what we have to do is reconnect them and learning how to feel and become present within our body. So that's learning to read what my body is telling me, the different sensations. So when I have the grumbling in my stomach or the pain in my stomach, am I really hungry? Or is that anxiety? Is there something going on that's really difficult for me? The tightness in my chest, what is my body telling me? The pain in the neck, what's really happening? Is it a headache or is there a situation that's got me really tense and stressed and I just am not having that uh, awareness of it? So a lot of it is coming back into our bodies and learning how to listen to what our body is telling us. That's a really difficult thing for a lot of folks to do when their relationship with food has been so distorted, has been so difficult that we're really not connected with our physical selves. So we went a few minutes over. We apologize. This is just some articles that I've read in the past. I thought I'd include them. Go ahead and look them up. Um, any thoughts or questions? <laughs>